Hi, so uh, my name is George, and I'm going to uh, geek out for the next 15 minutes or so on uh, transportation. Um, I want to ask, and if, I'm going to see if I can actually see this. Can I ask a raise of hands, please, for those who um, uh, put uh, public transit here today to get to the MCA? Oh, a bunch. Good. Um, can I see a raise of hands for those who drove or took a taxi or even tried car sharing? That was me. Anybody uh, bike or ride? Any hands? Like two people. <laughs> All right. Um, how about the water taxi? Did anybody use water taxi? You know that it exists, right? Nobody. OK, so um, the show of hands, I think, sort of reflects the transportation landscape that we have here in Chicago. And um, the reason I want to talk about transportation in general is that these little individual decisions we make and what we choose to use to navigate the city affect all of us. And they affect us in lots of different ways. Sometimes we end up being late. We end up in traffic jams. Uh, sometimes we end up uh, missing appointments, for, for instance. Uh, but on a larger scale, as a city, the collective decision-making power of all of us together can affect us in a really pr profound set of ways. Um, the way the city plans for its infrastructure, the way that we plan um, and project for economic growth, the way that we um, even decide where we're going to be living in the city is all affected by this uh, large mass of decisions we make as a city, particularly around transportation. Now, in 2008, I was lucky enough to um, uh, join the CTA and actually become their lead designer. It was a newly created position. Um, with regard to a leadership change that had happened at the, uh, at the city. Uh, I felt very fortunate because I got to see firsthand how design got to play a role with the way in which people started to interact with public services. Um, and I also got to see firsthand also some of, the, um, some of the tensions that exist between public services and the public. Um, it's a challenging environment, I'm sure you can imagine, being um, a public servant. But at the CTA, there's a lot of... Uh, anxiety that exists certainly within the agency but also people who use the system who are um, used to it being maybe less than stellar. Um, <clears throat> when I was there this adversarial attention existed for many in lots of different ways sometimes it would manifest in terms of uh, customer surveys or um, town hall meetings but there was this adversarial feeling in the air between both parties. I remember hearing from a, um, a CTA staff member one day, he was joking, I hope, uh, this quote here, we'd have a great survey if it wasn't for all the people. I'm pretty sure he was joking, but it's a, it's a true quote. And for me, it sort of describes this tension that exists between public services and, pu and the public. Now, rightly so, the CTA's main focus is to provide um, operational logistical expertise, as it were, to making sure that buses and trains arrive every single day, that they run. And uh, if you've ever had to try and consider how many thousands of buses that we have in the city and how many trains exist every day, that just getting them onto the road or onto track is actually quite a gargantuan task. You might argue that, sure, they don't maybe turn up on time when you want them, but they at least run. And that actually is a lot of work. Um, but I've also often sort of made the analogy that um, the CTA is sort of like a really good logistics company. It's almost a little bit like they're like FedEx. They like ship packages, but with one big difference. These packages, you see, are full of people. So for me, as a designer working at the CTA, the experience of those riders and designing those experiences was really, really important. But I can contest that the CTA's main focus is in making sure those packages move. Now, uh, while, product, while designing this prototype bus for the city, um, I also got to see um, a number of different tensions that happen from leadership changes that, that exist. And um, after only, unfortunately, 11 months at the CTA, um, a leadership change happened, and um, the antibodies, as it were, that surrounded my position and my role suddenly disappeared. And a little bit like organ rejection, I got the boot. Um, so, and it really was a shame because I felt like I was starting to have some impact there. And having this role of a person who was an advocate for users I thought was pretty important. Thankfully now, I'm a tenure track professor at the School of the Art Institute, and I take all the lessons I had from the CTA and try to carry them over to the lessons that I teach for my students to try and see how design can have a large major impact on a citywide scale. Now, the thing is, you see, when, when I, the reason I took the job at the CTA is because I was able to try and leverage my seven plus years of user-centered design experience in different consultancies and try to apply them to the CTA. I felt like if I got given this opportunity to make a change there uh, and then didn't take it, I basically forfeit my right to complain about it, i.e. no more whining. Um, so if I want to whine, then I can whine only after I've done my bit. But really, the, the problem is that because it was only for 11 months, 
I felt like there was this itch that was still over there. There was this itch that I hadn't got to scratch properly. So um, last summer, my wife and I at Greater Good Studio, we are co-founders, uh, sort of put together and sort of pulled together all our assets, uh, tried to think about all the resources we had, all the um, experiences we had, even our personal network, and try to see if we could help. How can we help, you see, uh, Chicagoans make better decisions about their transportation if we ourselves don't have hundreds of million dollars to sort of pony up and start buying buses and, and trains? Uh, how can we help with these limited resources? Um, so th that's what we started to ask ourselves. Uh, but before we started to try and see if we can design these new tools, these new, probably, these new like, uh, public transit tools, we realized from my lessons at TTA that what we actually really needed was to design a process to get people to design those tools. We, in a way that, so that the public was engaging with it in a different way. Up until that time, most of my experience with public engagement had really been through these clumsy tools like surveys and, and um, focus groups and uh, town hall meetings. So what I realized what we really needed was a new model for public engagement, a new way for the public to engage with their services, the ones that we've already actually paid for. Ironically enough, we've already paid for them, but we don't seem to get as much value as I think we could. So what we needed to design was not just the tools, but the process to get to those tools. It's pretty hard. So we called this model Designing Chicago, and, um, and we uh, decided to do it. So um, how many of you have heard of this notion of crowdsourced design? I'm going to take a look again. It's a bunch. Has anyone ever been involved in anything like that? Ah, one. OK, great presentation, good. Um, so in my mind, when I'd heard about crowdsourced design, I, as, a, as, a, as a professional designer, I think I'd always had a bit of a tension with the notion of this crowd of designers, these untrained, unwashed masses, somehow being able to design stuff. And in my mind, I kept coming up with images like this, this angry mob <laughs> of people like brandishing Sharpies and Post-it notes and just like scribbling things and going, Wah! and just designing things at will. And I thought, uh, do, I, do I want that? Do I really want to have that as part of my team? Do I want that you know, rampaging through my studio? And it took me a second to understand that, of course, yes, we do. We need to find a way to which we can make that crowd work, not just have a crowd in general. So in terms of even just internal messaging, we started realizing we needed to change the way in which we talk about it. So rather than calling it crowdsourcing and crowdsource design, uh, we realized we needed a new term. So when we started thinking about those sort of uh, methods that we've been using so far for public engagement, and again, this model that we have to create, we started looking against this landscape. So we created this very handy framework uh, where the uh, quantity of, pop of people that you use is sort of uh, represented on this horizontal axis, and the quality of understanding, as it were, is represented on this vertical axis. So for me, what I started to realize was that there is a place for surveys, town hall meetings, even focus groups, and I would put that in this bottom right-hand corner. Lots of people, typically, but generally kind of shallow in its understanding. It's difficult to make really informed decisions about what to do next when you have lots of people answering little tiny checkboxes. Now, over on the left-hand side, uh, bottom left, we have gut intuition, which is almost like any one of you deciding to do something for a project, just individually, um, no sample size other than yourself, using your gut, which does exist on this landscape. Now, for us in the design world, the sort of gold standard that I've always worked against is we called ethnographic research, and we've put it up in this top left-hand corner. Small sample sizes, but really, really deep understanding whereby we interview people, we observe them in their context, and we make really, truly, uh, I think, profound insights around behavioral needs, but those sample sizes are always really small as a function of sort of getting to know them so well. But as you realize that there's this gap up here, top right-hand corner, how do we do a lot of people, and how do we get lots of understanding? I'm actually asking, how do we, I, I, I don't know. I, I, does anybody, damn it. Okay, fine, so, um, so we have to come up with this idea because that's the holy grail. The idea of getting this research method whereby we have lots of people and great understanding at the same time is so elusive, it's like a unicorn of research. How do we do it? So we had to try and think really hard, how are we actually gonna crack this? Because no one that we know had ever done it before. So we started to realize that actually we might have a special weapon. It's almost like a street fighter special move and it's because we're teachers. Now, are there any teachers in the room? Thank God. Hello. Hi. Um, so as a few of the teachers may, may recognize this, um, my understanding of it, that given enough um, structure to your classroom, a faith in your students, and the time and patience to grow, it's a transformative experience for both the teacher and the student. What we realize is that teaching actually might help unlock this whole 
uh, uh, angry mob phenomena and actually help us get to that top right corner. It might help us unlock this issue of how do we get lots of people to be understanding. And once we started realizing it was a teaching issue and not, a, not a, like a logistics issue, it really reframed the problem for us. And for us, it suddenly realized, oh, I get it. The city's a classroom. If we just treat the whole city as a classroom and then we get to teach it, A, it suddenly becomes, it's completely voluntary. It becomes something that people opt into and we frame it as an opportunity to learn. And that suddenly realized, wow, we can actually, we might have a shot at this because it's really, really hard otherwise. I, I mean, none of you jokers came up with the idea. So like, we, <laughs> no, we didn't know either. So we thought, okay, maybe, maybe this might be the way to get up to that top right quadrant. So it allowed us to come up with a new term rather than crowdsourced people, crowdsourced design, we realized that all we really have is just new members to our team, a new public design team. And you can consider it to be individual team members, just lots and lots of them, or a blended team member, as it were. Somebody that's an amalgam of hundreds and hundreds of people all around the city that have all these different perspectives. And what's so awesome about that is that you no longer have to rely on you and your and rest of your internal team knowing everything. You can't possibly know everything. I'm only 36. 37 soon. How can I know everything there is to know about public transit? I'm sure that every one of you in this room, and there's probably 300 of you, have a slightly different perspective on transit than I do, which is important because when we're trying to design services for everyone, everybody has to have a say. So we started realizing that this public design team notion is what we were actually after. So the project is, after we designed, realized that there was this process, we realized we still have to do a project. We have to manifest this project. We have to manifest this process. And what we realized is that what we need to have is designed a new mobile app, a mobile app for transit that will allow um, uh, people to help navigate the city. And rather than starting from a technology standpoint, uh, we realized that we need to start from somewhere else. We started, rather than from technology, starting at user needs, and rather than asking the question of what can we do, we wanted to ask the question of what should we do? What should we do that will help people get better? Because if we only ever took the left-hand approach, Frankly, we'd end up with a transit app that was only incrementally better than what we have on the market right now. We wanted to have something that's profoundly different, and we think that this process will help us get us there. So we decided, okay, let's do this thing. Let's go all at it. We will launch this thing, launch this project. Uh, this is a photo from our Kickstarter uh, and the launch party that we had in our studio. We had hundreds of people in this thing. It was incredibly public, incredibly open. We were so exposed, and it was terrifying. Um, we launched this thing to a huge fanfare in front of all our peers, and um, uh, everybody said that we weren't going to make it. They all kept saying, all the naysayers kept telling us, you're never going to make it, it's going to be terrible, you're going you're to blow it. And they were right. We didn't make the fund at all. We completely blew it. It was the most excruciatingly painful thing I'd ever had to go through. It was so embarrassing on a, like a global level, because we had press from everywhere. Everybody was on us of this project, and they could all just sort of slowly watch this, this fund never make the goal. I thought, ay ay ay. So we had to pick ourselves up. After a couple of days of sort of crying myself to sleep, I realized that with this failure, this epic fail that we had managed to do, we suddenly realized we were free of all the expectations that came along with it. We were free suddenly to do whatever we wanted. Failing and the fear of failing is so, it's such a paralysis for most people. Once we realized that once we just got through it, we were free to do anything. We're off the hook now. It doesn't matter if we screwed up again. We already screwed up so big, who cares? <laughs> so I always tell my students that success hides learning. I feel like when you are successful, it's so easy to brush over the lessons that are staring you in the face. In this case, I couldn't do anything but stare at the lesson, which was blinking at me in big LEDs. The lesson was simplify the story. We'd made it too complicated when we did the original pitch. And by simplifying it, we realized that there may be some principles from this project going forward. So we have three principles to share with you. Principle one, give the team a role and give it a name. So um, when we invited people who were all volunteers, and I, I, there may even be somebody in the audience that might be an, uh, a volunteer for this team. I, I don't know, is there, maybe? No. Um, we gave them the title of urban agent. We thought it was important that they had, a, they had like a title. It's not like we were giving out business cards, but we could, we could give them a name so they could say, oh, man, I'm an urban agent now. And um, what we realized is that by setting expectations for people, telling them sort of what their job was, they started taking it really seriously, way more seriously than I thought would, anyone would do, because they were volunteering their time. And they started signing their emails, agent number 44, or agent 77, and they're like, <laughs> you know, we just made this up, you know. But somehow they all just kept playing along, and they kept doing the work. It was, to me, it was amazing. 
and another reminder of how, many, how people will play along if they know there's some general good to it. Second principle, ask the team questions that respect their intelligence and their expertise. Now again, going back to the surveys again, to me that was sort of like the best in class that I'd seen in public uh, interaction, this, this public question and answer. And to me, I, I, I sort of believe that there's no stupid questions, but there are some that are deeply, deeply flawed. So to me, whenever I see these types of questions going out there with a scale of one to 10 or how well we're doing, I find it's troubling because I can't do anything with the results other than a vague response of, I will do better, or I will improve the service. So we felt like we had to do it completely differently. So with that teaching model, and again, we're trying to get to as many people as possible, we realized we need to create training videos in research and in design that we broadcast onto the internet to get people to sort of come along for the ride. In this training towards becoming an urban agent, you have to kind of follow the homework. So we asked a couple of different questions. Firstly, observe your commute and look out for transit tools. This was the first of four assignments. And we were amazed at the kinds of responses we got back. Because when we asked this question around tra transit tools, we asked a second question, which was, what is this transit tool doing? And then what do you wish it could do? We were fascinated by these results. What we started to get back was all sorts of things, long, long, like well past the transit apps you might expect or signage. We started getting responses back from a whole bunch of things. And um, again, because we asked it in a particular way, we were basically banning, if we, could, if we could even use the term, we were preventing people from whining. Because you're not asking whiny questions, you're not getting whiny answers. Ask better questions and you'll get better answers from your public. So the questions we started asking about transit tools, we had two great examples here. Somebody started using the cub schedule to determine whether or not they would take the train that day. And if anyone's ever been on a, drunk, a train full of drunks, you know why they do that. So then on this other side, um, this person uses the skyline to determine whether or not they're on the right side of the metro tracks. It's like, this stuff is fascinating. I would never have known these things, and you certainly wouldn't have got it from a survey. So amazingly enough, we had over 300 plus submissions from all around the world that all came onto our website, and we posted everything. So it was all available for free. So all these other app developers are, I think, looking at us and wondering, hey, this is really cool. This is good stuff. It's all free. So uh, we're happy to share it with everyone, because it's not really ours. It's everyone's, uh, everyone's property, really. So we um, got all these submissions, and we started to see patterns between functional needs and emotional needs. And the emotional needs were the ones where we thought we could add the most value. Ones were to reroute to plan B. These are the biggest design opportunities. Compared to true cost of options, accelerate my learning. And I'm going to just talk about the, number, the second one for a second. We found that a lot of transit apps didn't really take into account the full true cost of going downtown in a car, which includes parking and the time it takes to find a spot. And when you don't do that, you kind of get a skewed perspective on, where, on, on car ownership and driving downtown when compared with other options like a $2.25 um, bus ride. So principle three, give the team tools so they can respond with solutions. Now to do that, we had to design this online platform that allowed all of us to take all of these amazing insights and, and observations and drawings. And we also started hosting a number of different workshops in our studio to allow in-person, uh, non-internet-based interaction with us as a team. And we got amazing work, uh, workshop materials, all these brainstorms being done. And the question might be coming up, well, how, how is it possible that these people who are untrained in anything other than maybe accounting or, or any other sort of uh, regular practice and not design, how can they be helpful to you in designing an app? Don't they have to be talented, people kept asking. And I've always had the contention that talent is merely ability without training. So I can guarantee as a teacher that we can train you enough to be a contributor. Don't worry about talent. That is completely not, not an option in this, sorry, not even an issue in this situation. The only prerequisite to making a su submission is to have an idea. So we had over 600 ideas generated in about four weeks from all of these different people who were all works of life from, from, from us. And uh, we were blown away by all these contributions. <clears throat> and then we culminated in a final workshop where we had um, 12 urban agents come into our studio and shop for ideas. We had those 600 ideas went down to 70 different app features, which we sort of posted up on the wall. And they shopped for this app. They basically built the app themselves with five different app features that they could post on paper. And then they actually started drawing the wireframes of this early app idea, this early, early prototype for themselves with like big paper templates. Now, before we start getting you know, really fancy and start thinking that this is the best thing out of the world and start patting ourselves on the back, we have to remember that there's so many people we never met. There are so many people, that, populations that we just never will meet right now because of those limited resources. There are literally just the four of us in our team and no funding. So that means that how are we going to meet all these other people? Well, the challenge remains that if we get funding for this next phase, 
we will commit ourselves to reaching back out to all the communities that we didn't reach, the churches, the community centers, the schools. We will do that with this latest stage um, uh, phase of the project, but we are very excited and, and I'm incredibly proud of the work that all of these people so far have done for us and with us. So um, uh, leaving you with these three principles, give the team a role and give it a name, ask the team intelligent questions that respect their intelligence and their expertise, give the team tools so they can respond with solutions. So what I will leave with you is that um, as you start to think about your next projects, um, start to consider if you can take for a moment what a public design team member might add to your team. And I think um, you'll be amazed at sort of the work we can all do together. Thank you.